It's something scientists and medical professionals alike have been asking for decades. Where do depression and anxiety come from? New research is revealing that the health of your brain might actually be connected to the health of your gut. Joining us now for more on this mind-gut connection in Naples, Florida, David Perlmutter, author of Brain Maker, The Power of Gut Microbes to Heal and Protect Your Brain for Life. And David, it's good to have you back on the program. Perhaps we can just start by your having telling us uh, what Brain Maker, the title of the book, refers to. Well, I'm a neurologist and I deal with brain disorders day in and day out. And what Brain Maker really reveals is that the answer to our brain problems isn't in the brain. I mean, somebody once asked uh, Slick Willie Sutton, the bank robber, why do you rob banks? He said, because that's where the money is. Turns out uh, that the, the answer for our biggest brain issues like Alzheimer's and autism and ALS may not be in the brain at all. It's actually in the gut. It's actually very, very good news because there are things now that we can do to change our brain's destiny. What a, what a thought. What is a microbiome, and am I saying that properly? You get points, you said it right. The microbiome is this collection of more than 100 trillion organisms that are living in your gut right now. And beyond just bugs in the gut, they are controlling the destiny of your brain in terms of your risk for brain illness down the line. But more importantly, they're actually controlling the functionality of your brain, how sharp you are, what is your mood right now as we have this conversation? And how in recent years has your understanding of what's happening in the microbiome changed? Well, to be clear, we had no understanding about anything with, with respect to the microbiome until maybe five years ago. It was in 2008, as a matter of fact, that scientists began looking at the gut bacteria and realizing that they play such an important role in human health. That's when here in America we funded $115 million, the Human Microbiome Project, to begin to explore what are these bugs doing, how are they affecting our health, and now more importantly, how are they affecting brain health, and how are the changes that are happening to our gut bacteria because of our lifestyle choices, like our food choices, how are these changes impacting our health, and probably at the end of the day, most important, importantly, what can we do to fix the situation? Hmm. How do you like this occasional reference we hear to the gut as your second brain? Well, I don't know who came first, but uh, <laughs> you know, the gut is deeply innervated uh, with tons of nerves just like the brain. And there is this, there's really no dichotomy. There's no separation between the gut and the brain. People talk about the gut and the brain connection, but in reality, they function as a unit. That your brain every moment is deeply influenced by things going on in your gut and lo and behold the biggest influence on what is going on in your gut happens to be your food choices so what an empowering notion it is that you can control your brain's functionality day to day based upon the foods that you choose to eat now i notice on the cover of the book you've got a huge piece of green broccoli so that's a pretty good hint as to what you think is a good idea to keep the second brain going well. Uh, a lot of people don't like broccoli, though, David. So, what do we do about uh, what do we do about this? I, I think <laughs> I think it was President George Bush, George Bush the first who said he didn't eat broccoli, but uh, we'll leave that alone. Uh, I, I think that the real key is to focus on first of all foods that are fermented. That's the kom kombucha, the kimchi, uh, the fermented uh, vegetables, uh, sauerkraut, foods like that, uh, cultured yogurt that are very rich in good bugs, good bacteria that will nurture back your microbiome. We also want to focus on foods that are prebiotic, meaning that they're high in specific types of fiber, like inulin, that will then allow these uh, bacteria in your gut to multiply and to do the good things that they do. And those are things like uh, Jerusalem artichoke, uh, jicama or Mexican yam, onions, leeks, garlic, and one of my favorites, which is dandelion greens. And beyond that, you really want to make sure that you're getting out of your diet those types of foods that will threaten your gut bacteria. And those are the sugars, and even more importantly, the artificial sweeteners. Who knew? The artificial sweeteners will change your gut bacteria significantly. And in fact, that change will increase your risk for diabetes. Think about that. Drinking sugarless soda, no sugar at all, no calories, and yet it's doubling your risk for diabetes. Let's just understand, because you've, you've used the word bacteria, and there may be an assumption that all bacteria is bad. 
There's good bacteria and bad bacteria, and perhaps you could help us understand the significance of the difference between the two. Well, Steve, that's a very good point. And, you know, we've been trained to fear bacteria. I mean, after all, the bubonic plague in the 14th century wiped out a third of Europe. But now we understand that we are desperate for the health of our gut bacteria, without which we could not survive. That these good bugs, most of which living within us are good bugs, are there and they're providing things that allow us to live. They are setting our immune system. They're controlling the process of inflammation. They're determining whether we are fat or lean, and they're even modifying, changing our mood moment to moment. So we've got to give them a lot of respect, and we've got to give them what they need, recognizing that your foods, the foods that you choose to eat, are actually feeding those very bacteria that live within you who are controlling the strings of your future in terms of your health. Let's move to some discussion now about depression and inflammation and see if there is a connection between the two. First off though, we need a good definition of what inflammation is, so help us on that. Inflammation as a definition. Inflammation is actually a good thing. Everybody thinks it's bad, but it's a protective mechanism whereby when a body part is injured, certain things happen, chemicals are secreted to to heal that injury. If it's a, a foreign invader, to get rid of that invader, to immobilize a part if it's been broken. So inflammation, when it's under control, is actually a favorable body reaction. The problem is when inflammation is out of control, then it is related to such things as coronary artery disease, diabetes, cancer, Alzheimer's, autism, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. And who knew that these brain situations are devastating in that they're related to this process that we're all familiar with, and that is inflammation. And what we now understand about inflammation is that primarily it is something coming from the gut. And it's really caused by leakiness of the gut when the barrier in the gut lining uh, becomes compromised. That happens when the balance of organisms in the gut are disrupted. And that happens when the diet is poor, when we overuse antibiotics, when we're born by cesarean section, when we take acid blocking drugs, when we take non-steroid anti-inflammatory medications. These all represent challenges to the gut bacteria, lead to leakiness of the gut. And for our purposes today, that can compromise the brain function and puts you at higher risk for brain disease. Now, you mentioned a lengthy list of terrible things that can happen to you as a result of inflammation, but you didn't mention depression, and I wonder if there is a connection between the gut and depression as well. Without a doubt, and in fact, uh, this research goes back at least to 2008, understanding that this compromise of the integrity of the gut lining leads to inflammation, and the markers of inflammation perfectly correlate with the degree of depression that a person may experience. So we're able to measure that in the clinical setting and in research settings, markers of inflammation perfectly correlating to depression. That said, what's the empowering then part of our discussion? It means that we are now seeing powerful leverage, powerful improvements uh, in individuals in terms of their depression when we focus not just on the smoke by giving them an antidepressant drug that works in the brain, but focus on the fire. What is the fire? That's the inflammation. In fact, the word inflammation comes from inflammar, the Latin term for fire. That's where the word flame comes from. And indeed, when you pay attention to the gut and rehab the gut and fix the gut bacteria, that's when you see some dramatic improvements in depression in blood sugar balance, uh, in people who are suffering from weight gain and don't know why that's happening. Hmm. Well, let me follow up with this. About an hour west of here is McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. And in 2011, they did a study on so-called germ-free mice to determine if there is a connection between gut bacteria and mood. Can I get you to share some of the findings of what they came up with? Sure. I mean, that was a landmark study. And what they did was, of course, they were experimenting with germ-free mice. These are mice that do not have any gut bacteria. And they, they noted that their anxiety-like behavior when confronted with novel situations, when they were confronted with uh, new situations, was dramatically different if they lacked gut bacteria in comparison to those mice that either had good bacteria or were inoculated with various strains of bacteria during the course of that study. 
I'll tell you another bit of research that's come out of Canada that I think is even uh, more exciting. Uh, University of Ontario, uh, Dr. Derek McFabe, has now identified specific changes in the gut bacteria that correlate with autism. So think about that for a moment, that autism may well represent a change in the gut bacteria, which may well explain why children with autism have so much in the way of digestive uh, issues. So he's done similar work in treating uh, uh, and using an autistic model of a laboratory animal as they did at McMaster and seeing improvements when uh, changes are brought on to the gut bacteria in, in the autistic model of, of the rodent that mimics the human. Really very fascinating research. I don't want to take you too far down a road that you're not content to go down, but uh, are you I'm saying content. that... Okay, well, are, are you saying that if they really start okay. to get a better understanding of a potential connection between autism and gut bacteria, you could end autism? Yes. Uh, that's a conditional statement that you made, and the answer is yes to a conditional statement. Could they end autism? Let me give you an example. The University of Arizona is now re has completed recruiting a whole bunch of autistic children, and they're going to reprogram their gut bacteria based upon this understanding that the gut bacteria is uh, changed in the autistic child. And how they're going to do that is with a technique called fecal microbial transplant. They're going to take the gut bacteria and fecal material from a healthy individual and transplant that into the colon of autistic children to see what happens. Well, one of my patients has already completed that uh, process, and his uh, video uh, after he completed the, the process of fecal transplant is on my website, drperlmutter.com. We uh, talk about his case in the book Brain Maker. We present his case, and as a matter of fact, about an hour before this interview, his mother phoned me and let me know that he's still doing really well and gave me an update. So uh, for your viewers who want to see what a child can look like with autism, uh, visit that video. It's on my website. Fascinating. Okay, let's talk about another study. UCLA, 36 women. Uh, yogurt, pick up the story if you would. Sure. That's a study done by Dr. Emron Meyer. And what Dr. Meyer did was really, I think, breathtaking, and I told him so. Uh, he gave a lecture at Harvard that I was fortunate enough to be at, and uh, he took 36 women and divided them into three groups. The first group ate a probiotic-enriched yogurt. The second group ate a yogurt that did not have probiotics in it. And the third group uh, was a placebo. And he followed these women over four weeks, and after four weeks, he performed a brain scan on them called functional MRI. It basically looks at what parts of the brain are being activated. And when he did this fMRI, he showed these women a kind of a, a scary picture of a face, somebody, a challenging, scary uh, image of a face. And those women who had consumed the probiotic-enriched yogurt had a dramatically different response. Their brain anxiety centers, if you will, were not as challenged or activated in comparison to the other women. What does it tell us? It means that just changing the gut bacteria changed the way these women perceived the world around them. I think that is absolutely breathtaking, and I told him so. And he, being the consummate scientist, said, well, of course, it's, it's good research, uh, but we need to do more. But I'm telling you, I think that is groundbreaking information to consider that the food we eat changes the way we perceive the world around us, and it's all predicated on changing the gut bacteria. That's the focus of BrainMaker, and in fact, we talk about his work in BrainMaker. In which case, let's leave everybody in our last minute here with some do's and don'ts. If you want to improve the gut bacteria, what do you do, what don't you do? Well, uh, if you're paying attention to your children, do your very best not to deliver them by C-section. Kids pick up their first bacteria when they pass through the birth canal. Having a C-section increases the risk of ADHD, autism, type 1 diabetes, allergies, and even adult obesity. <laughs> that said, let me be clear, a C-section is a very important procedure. It saves lives, so uh, there, it has its place. Avoid overusage of antibiotics. It, it directly threatens and changes the gut bacteria. Eat a diet that's low in sugar, that has lots of what we call prebiotic fiber, the foods I mentioned earlier. Welcome back to the table fermented foods, uh, foods like kimchi and kombucha and cultured yogurt, and even consider taking a good wide-spectrum probiotic supplement. 
These are the keys to rehabbing your gut bacteria. And again, remember that your gut bacteria are controlling your brain's destiny. Hmm. You always leave us with such fascinating information, uh, Dr. Perlmutter. It's always good of you to appear on TVO. The name of the book, once again, is called Brain Maker, The Power of Gut Microbes to Heal and Protect Your Brain for Life. David Perlmutter out of Naples, Florida, thanks so much again. Thank you, Steve. Great to be with you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.